to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. My friend, Eric Ross, joins me on the show today. And right off the bat, I want to let you know two things about Eric. One you might expect, which is that Eric is the definition of a charming Southern gentleman, which I can assure you he is in real life too. And the other is that Eric is a seasoned design professional. More accurately, he's a seasoned businessman who has figured out the exact best way for him to run his firm with no apologies. You'll learn for t- for t- in today's show with Eric that this best way for him means working only on the projects to use his words, make him sing, working with the right client, and working within a fee structure that he does not waver from. Eric explains how he runs his private interior design studio just like a retail store, and he takes us back to two critical moments in his journey as an entrepreneur. One involved some wallpaper, that wasn't exactly a happy project, and the other was an aha moment in the bathroom with his wife, Ruth Ann. These were the genesis for his decision to run his firm the way he does today. And if you haven't heard of Eric, you've been missing out. Eric is a designer who has lived and breathed traditional living since he was a child. He lives in Nashville with his truly lovely wife, Ruth Ann, and their daughter, Julianne. With over 20 years of design experience, his work has been published in Traditional Home, Southern Style, Southern Lady, The Cottage Journal, and many other publications. Now, before I introduce you to Eric, I want to invite you to come with me to our fourth podcast birthday party. That's right. My friends at Kravit and 200 Lex are hosting us, and we'd love it if you'd join us. It's going to be this March 19th, 2020, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the new Kravit Gorgeous workspace at 200 Lex. The RSVP is on my website, luannigara.com, under the events tab, and you can also search for it on Eventbrite. And while I'm talking about Kravit, did you know that Lee Jofa is introducing its fifth collection with renowned interior designer Kelly Wurstler? That's right. This assortment of fabric and wall covering is an experiment experimentation with scale and color, building off her past collections. Like you might expect, Kelly draws inspiration from vintage fashion, historical references, art and design, giving you a collection that is truly signature Kelly. To source this collection for your next project, go to kravit.com forward slash Lee Jofa. All right, I'm really looking forward to introducing you to my friend Eric. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thanks for having me. Eric, today we are going to really turn the industry on its ear a little bit, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) So (laughs) in our pre-air conversation, you were explaining to me your business model and the way that you run your firm. And your term for it is run your business like a store. And I am... I, the, in, in in 500 interviews, no one has ever, at least in my in 500, no one has said they are running their their interior design firm this way. Let alone someone who is considered a high end luxury interior designer and an interior designer that does not have a retail storefront. So the concept of running your interior design firm like a store without a storefront. Tell me what you mean by that, Eric. Well, we run our showroom or our our studio, my design portion, which is really, I should say, decorating portion of my business. There really are two tracks in my business. One is design consultation, which would be basically construction remodeling. And I do charge a flat fee for that based on the size of the project. 
and how long it's going to take. Okay. With decorating, which is my other track, which is really my, my first love and my passion is decorating. And I don't look at decorating the word decorator as a negative. A lot of designers, a lot of interior designers look at that and have a connotation of negativity with decorating. But decorating is a real skill and it takes years to refine you're and you're born a decorator or you're not you know design you can teach people design you can teach people cad and furniture layouts and all of that but being a decorator i really look at it as a badge of honor so with a decorating track of my business which is basically if you have four walls and a ceiling that's the track you go in in my studio and that's where you're buying product to decorate your house that's draperies rugs furniture you know soft furniture case goods art you know anything decorative anything in the decorative arts then you would buy through our studio which we put a full markup on and sell it like you would if you went into a store and bought it off of a floor so that doesn't mean i inventory all of those things it just means that my margins are hefty like a storefront is and all of my re, uh, design services are included in that pricing okay so let me pull it apart a little bit all right yeah. so here's what we're saying let's let's we're taking off the table if someone comes to you and says I'm going to build a new home and I have a piece of property and I have, you know, uh, home plans and an architect and I'd like you to provide all the finishes and the surfaces and la la la. That's a different thing. We're not talking about that now. That pro type of project you are going to charge design fees for. But probably the bulk of many designers uh, work is the other. What you said is you, I meet you, you have your room, whether it's five rooms, one room, an entire home, it exists and you want me to redecorate it, like, to use your word, redecorate it whether that means pull it all down to bare walls or refresh the space. And in that case, that's the model that we're talking about now, that end of your business. Correct. And, okay. And so what happens is we know, both you and I know, and of course all the listeners know, that even in that business model, that redecorate of an existing space, it is absolutely 99% of the conversations I've had, the designer is going to say to me, I'm going to give you a design fee for that, and then we're going to talk about the purchases. And what you're saying is there's no design fee attached to that, but you're, but you're going to buy everything from me as if I had a store, and I'm going to make profit and a nice profit on every item that we do. Correct. I love it. Okay. So now, here's the thing. I know, uh, you know, 10,000 designers just went, how do you make them buy it from you? My designers want to shop me. So my clients want to shop me. So Eric, talk to us about the way it has to come in my mind, logically, in the way you have your first conversations with your clients in educating them in the way your philosophy and your firm works. Talk to us about that. Well, a lot of this starts on the phone. I mean, we get a lot because we have such a large social media presence and an active website and we get a lot of calls and direct messages for services. So I really do a lot of this um, on the front end on the phone rather than going out to every, I just said, I can't, I simply can't go to every, used to, I would go out to every single house. If someone called, you know, I would give them, you know, an hour, you know, in their home and go out and have a conversation just because, you really, it is, it is difficult to have those kind of conversations on the front end, you know, over the phone, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, they're asking you questions about their house and the size and budget. And of course, you I can't, can't see it. See it. <laughs> um, but, you know, we talk about when we're, when they, when they get a new client, basically I tell them or a new prospect, I say, this is how we work. I'm going to, I'm not going to charge you for time. We do not charge for time, but we charge you the retail price of the product. And what that means is I buy it at wholesale from the manufacturer and I resell it to you at retail. So I do not discount my product. That Luann is what I call transparency in our business. I think transparency in today's terms in interior design is ba the, the definition to most people is their client wants to see the cost of the goods. Mm -hmm. They want to see a receipt from the vendor and they're going to put their commission on it. You know, some designers charge 30%, you know, for everything they purchase. Some designers charge 50%. You know, actually I think 30% is kind of the high end plus they're billing for time. Right. 
I just have never worked that well. I won't say never. When I first started in this business, you know, I had a very direct conversation. Well, a client chewed me out, just absolutely refused to believe that I spent three hours looking for wallpaper and it, it for their laundry room, which, <laughs> you know, most people who aren't in design think that's crazy. But mm-hmm. as you know, you know, you're looking for the perfect fabric. You know, the client gives you a set of parameters. You know, there's a look they're going for, there's colors they like, there's the size of the room, which dictates scale. So it takes a lot of time. So, but the client doesn't understand that. They think we just walk into a resource room, pull out a book and point to a, a paper and say, gee whiz, it, and it's fantastic. So they think it's going to take 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. So part of transparency, I think, in our in our industry really means explaining to the customer on the front end what they should expect. Mm-hmm. You know, in this, in our country, what's great about it is we get to turn, we get to set up our businesses any way we want to. And we get to decide <laughs> what our business model is. Right. But I think we... I think designers today are just going based on an old model and then, and and it's not working. And so they want to blame everyone on the outside of our industry and, and say, Oh, well, everything's available online and the internet. And so how am I supposed to make a living instead of looking at, you know, how, what, it, you know, the market system, our free market system basically rewards successes and, you know, you have, and doesn't reward people who are failing. So if it's failing, that's, you know, what is it that the customer's wanting that we're not providing? So, you know, when I, I didn't strategically change my business model this way, this is 20 years ago right. when I started. I've been doing this 21 years professionally. And 20 years ago, I said to myself, this doesn't work. I'm not, clients don't want a bill for time and to pay for their wallpaper or what, you know, their sofa. So mm-hmm. I just quit doing it. I just said, you know, if I bill you for the, you know, if I just bill you for the paper, is that more acceptable? And it is right. people and people happily pay me for their product rather than time and it also is a trust builder which is big in our business it's Mm -hmm. i mean trying to gain a client's trust on the front end is a big in every designer trust is the key issue do they trust me to that that i'm going to i'm really going to do what's best for their home and for their family and you know their the budget will kind of work itself after the fact that you know of trust so when I come and I start the, the, the discussion and the relationship with, look, I'm not going to bill you for every phone, phone call we're going to have. I'm right. not going to bill you every time I come over here to look at this paint for the fifth time because I'm obsessive compulsive and I want to make sure it's perfect <laughs> of whatever. Because I'm nuts and I want to check it again. <laughs> right, right. I want to draw this window treatment for the third time to make sure mm-hmm. it's gonna, that it's going to do what I think. You know, those people don't like getting bills. I mean, I don't like it. You know, when I... So I just I approached my business from the front end, how, what, what my expectation would be if I'm a consumer, which I am, and I'm going to buy, you know, a car, would I want to pay for the car and pay for the salesperson's time? Mm-hmm. No, I mm-hmm. wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You know, and people are people in our industry want to bill like an attorney when in fact, attorneys don't sell sofas. Right. That's All they can do is bill for time because it's in their head. Mm-hmm. And I'm not discounting our ability. What I'm what I'm discounting is the double dipping that I think happens in our industry. That designers want to bill for time and they want to make and they want to sell product. So the Well, way let me I, just pull so, let me just say something about it. About, okay. So the thing is I I think in other words, when you say double dipping I, I have to say, I, we've had a little discussion about this. Of course, we, we know each other. We've had dinner together yeah. in Nashville, right? And so I have a little bit more backstory than we've got our, our colleagues up to speed on with your thoughts. And I just want to cut in there to clarify what I think I know so that it informs what they're hearing, okay? Right. I, my understanding is you are not specifically saying – I disagree with the model of charging for time and charging for product because I believe it's double dipping. Uh, Because we know that the designer that charges for time and product isn't charging full margin on product. Correct. Right. So they're 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 accommodating. Yes. Their 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 fee structure. Exactly. Right. So you're not right. So you're not right. So you're not disparaging that. But what you're saying is, and this is why I was so excited to have this conversation, because what you're saying is in 
in contrast, just give some thought to the logic of the way you run your business. You don't have all of this angst over, you know, do I build them, you know, 10% up, 20%, 40%? Are they going to, am I going to split my, my, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Not discount. Am I, yeah, am I going to split my discount yeah. with them? All of that stuff. You're just saying, look, we're at, as consumers, we're conditioned to walk in, buy something and leave with that product. And you know what, by the way, what's so funny is Eric is, I know you listen to the show. It's, it fits the same analogy that I use all the time about going out to dinner. You know, we sat there at dinner and when the waiter brought the bill, we didn't sit there and go, well, what was really the cost of that wine? You know, what, what really did it cost? Because I want to pay it. I want a discount on it because we sat here with eight people and you know, we did a lot of business with you. We just paid because that's how business is done. And And the other thing that is, is I relate to this because I have spent three and a half years interviewing designers and trying to understand the business model and trying to understand this fee structure and knowing full well in window works, I do it exactly the way you do it. This well, is my price. there's a lot of who do it this way. This is what's oh, there are, I, I've never met anybody well, else that does it this that's way. What, nobody talks about it because I think <laughs> those of us who work this way keep it quiet oh, with other designers. Because, well, you're letting it out. <laughs> well, they don't want to talk. They don't. And I like, to your point, I'm not disparaging the way. No, you're if you not. Want to bill, if you want to bill hourly, go right ahead. I mean, I... I find it clumsy for myself. Right. Now I have ADHD. Um, I'm and I'm and I and I, I design based on my feeling. Like I walk into a room and I get an immediate sense of what it's supposed to be, what's mm-hmm. wrong with it, how I'm going to fix it. Um, so I'm quick at it. So see, if I charge for time, I'd lose money mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I can pick house. I can pick a house full of paint in 15 minutes. Done. Mm-hmm. Here we go. Here's your paint. Mm-hmm. So, and, but at and, the same so time, I'm billing you hourly. The- you're really the system doesn't hourly billing doesn't reward experience you know what it it really rewards inexperience because it's you're gonna be the less experienced you are of course it's gonna take you more time so the idea is that okay well we bill more per hour because it's gonna take us fewer hours when in reality you can't really bill for the value you build in you can't build someone i would have to bill a thousand dollars an hour to make money the money i make you know, decorating people's houses and filling it full of furniture. Right. I mean, and people aren't going to pay that. The market doesn't bear that. You know, that's the the real sales. The way I really pitch this to clients is the only way I can re, I can really control the outcome and give you the most beautiful room I can is if I buy it all. Right now, and tell I, me, I'm in control of the project. I'm, that way, I'm in control of the process, and it makes sense. And tell me, uh, let's go back a little bit more to the conversation at the beginning when you're meeting uh, the, the prospective client for the first time. So we're going to say that what I heard you say in there is that in the beginning, when you were probably not nearly as busy and didn't have you know thirty five thousand followers on Instagram and probably a dozen inquiries a week, you would basically it sounded like to me go on a free Free initial consult to, to yeah. yes okay so if we're li- if a designer is listening that doesn't get 10 or 12 inquiries a week or you know whatever it is then this is what your advice and the way that you forget advice the way you did it we're just going to talk about the way you did Correct. it Correct. you're 20 years in business it works for you so whether somebody likes it or doesn't like it there's no debating that it works okay so what you would say is what you, what worked for you is I did that free consult I walked in I spent that hour I didn't spend 15 hours I spent that hour and I got to know them I got to know their needs I got to know what their objectives were and I was able to provide and position myself as the solution okay all right and the way that the way you make that work is you're very specific on the front end would you before I went out I would say okay look this is not a design consultation Mm. this is an information gathering exercise Right. I am only here. I'm only going to be there to talk about the, the the scope of the project. The one or two rooms. That's another big a big thing that I've learned in this business is start small with clients. Mm. Most designers, their dream is, or they think that someone comes in and says, "I want you to do my whole house." Now that only happens in my experience, when you've done previous projects with someone, mm. when you have worked with them for 
you did their last house and they're moving and the trust is already there. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say, you know, we're, we've bought a new house and we want you to do it. Those are the, that's when I do those, those huge whole house projects. Mm -hmm. And and most, and a lot of clients call and say, we want you to do our whole house. And I have to say, I don't do that. Uh -huh. I'm going to start with one or two rooms because it's just, it really moves faster that way. If we start small, then you can, we learn each other a little bit more. It's like a dress rehearsal. So I'm, I'm learning. It's a trust building exercise, mm -hmm. basically. I've also given them permission not to buy a whole house of furniture. Right. So I automatically sort of put them at ease by saying that. It also makes it more manageable. The real, my number one reason for doing that is to make the sale close more quickly yeah. because if you have a smaller scope they're not as overwhelmed emotionally or financially right so their thought process is well if i really hate it it's one room right right and so rather than me trying to convince them to spend two hundred thousand dollars on five rooms they're going to spend you know 40 or 50 on one room it's just it's more manageable in their mind because it's not as big a risk. Well, and so once you, and once you do, in my experience, again, in, in my experience, right. one, once I do the one or two rooms, they're wowed. Then it's done. You're just moving along. Right. Well, they are like, oh my God, this guy knows what he's doing. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, because there's they, people see your work and they get, you know, get a referral, but you still haven't worked for them. So they're right. still cautious, right? you know, and so you know, once they see me install something, they're wowed. I mean, I've never had people not wow. No one's ever not liked my work. Most people die over the price. I mean, and that again was sort of strategic in my entire business has been, I would rather, I feel like when you do somebody's room, especially for the first time, it's job interview. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a job interview, you don't, you know, wear a sad sweater you've had for 10 years. Or, <laughs> you know, you really pull out all the stops, you know, your hair is amazing, your outfit's spot on. So I feel like our first room has to be amazing now. So, cause I would rather someone say, Eric is amazing. Oh my God, but he's so expensive. Than right. someone say, Oh, you know, I used Eric. It was okay. Right, you know, right, 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 right. Fit in with their budget, you know. So, you know, I, ha I always, the first room just sort of gives you more entree. And they may then say, well, I loved it all, but these lamps are too high. Let's change the lamps out or whatever. And, you know, it allows me to get to know more about their budget, what they're willing to spend. And it makes the next, the next time, after I do one room, you know what we do next? Three rooms. Right. And right. then we do the next three rooms because now – they're not as afraid and they can make decisions on three rooms when they couldn't have made decisions on four rooms. So that would have been because I've lost more sales and I learned that early on too in trying to get them to do five rooms because what, because they're, they're scared. Right, right, right. There's an anxiety so, there. Like, okay, yeah. his work looks good. The Instagram looks good. The website, but is it going to be, is it going to be good working with him? What's it going to be like Correct. in his process? Right. Correct. I have to say that, you know, what's interesting, Eric is I, I said it a moment ago, your model is very much, it's exactly like the window works model. Okay. Now completely different product and so many less moving parts and details that we have than you have. But the reality is the same. We do a free shop at home. I'm going to come out. We're going to talk about it. We're going to kick around ideas. I'm not necessarily pulling out samples. I'm not necessarily giving, right. you know You're what not, I mean? Not gonna, I don't want to hear about, and don't, I don't let them walk me all over their house. When right. I come in, when I tell them over the phone, I'm like, we're going to work on, be thinking about the one or two rooms we're going to start on. Right. That's what I always say. Well, is, right. So when I get there, we're only going to look at those two rooms. I'm not going to go on a tour of their whole 8,000 square foot house or, five or whatever. I, I, that's a big time suck. You right. can easily spend three hours. So this is where the designer has to have professional control right. over their client from the beginning. You have to, you have just, I'm not, you don't have to be mean. You're just like, Oh, no. you know, today we're only, I only have, you know, I have another meeting and it takes me 20 minutes to get there. And so today we're just going to look at your two rooms. We're going to work on, you know, I can see that other room another time. And I'm super excited about that. But I think that we need to, 
um, focus. I really want to focus and have enough time to talk about these two rooms that are important to you today. Well, and, and this is what I'm saying to you. What's so similar is because I can tell you the hundreds of times that someone has called up and said, I just built a new home and I need window treatments for the whole house. And I walk in there and I'm sitting there looking 99% of the time at a house that either is strictly sheetrock and paint and no furnishings yet, or, and especially in that case, if I walk in and it's sheetrock and paint and no furnishings, and you're going to sit there and say to me, we're going to pick window treatments for this whole house. It's like, no, ma'am, we are not doing that. Because yeah. to your point, the the level of questions and the level of information that I need to gather in order to help you arrive at the right treatment for every window when I'm looking at an empty house is so overwhelming to the client and that ultimate invoice is going to be so high without the benefit of really having the the safety that I will do the exact same thing. I will say, oh my goodness, this is awesome. When are you planning to move in? Oh, it's six weeks out. I'll tell you what, let's focus. What would be the one or two spaces that you absolutely must have coverage for to move in and sleep in this house. Is it your bedroom and your children's bedrooms? Is it the kitchen? Is it the family room? Is it bathrooms? Let's let's chunk it out because it's exactly what you said. If I can spend two hours figuring out the th two, three, four primary rooms to put a window treatment on. And, and I say to her, let's just get this done. Let's get you privacy now. And I say, I'll come back next week. We can start to work on another area, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as you have that first deposit on that first chunk everything moves smoother since instead it of does. that big overwhelming yeah. whoa it's thirty eight thousand dollars for window treatments yeah. Yeah. right and so and and that doesn't mean well, i never people, walk people in and sell a whole house but i'm just saying yeah, yeah people don't know what they're that's no. one of my core beliefs is that you know you you listen to the client however they don't know what their needs are no and they don't they understand don't what they're like used to your point they don't understand that in in order for you to design their entire you know 10 room house in one sitting one you know one project when they've never worked for you before it's they think they want it and I, you know there's people listening that have done it of course but i love the idea of let's create that foundation let's create that dance let's create our partnership let's create that trust this is important in this business model is is controlling your time yes because you know, in the other model, in the billing and the hourly billing model, you want to go out five. Like this is where also for me, that doesn't work for my personality, mm. my personality, my process, the way I process and my, the way I get passion from something is that, oh my God, I see this. I'm so excited. Let's run. Right. You know, I don't want to, if I, the thought, like I fire people clients who want to talk about a blue sofa five times five different <laughs> visits like and i will just flat out say to someone this just isn't my process it's not that your process is wrong you're a thinker i'm a feeler yeah, so yeah, we yeah. can't work together yeah, yeah 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 because if you're gonna think i can't do i have a heart i've had a couple of thinkers in my whole career in 20 years and they have been the most frustrating clients because I just come from another place. Right, right. You, know, you look at it and you know it's right or it's wrong. You don't have to describe it. You don't have to, like, you know, have a description of why it's right or wrong. It is or it isn't. Trust me, lady. Right? Yes, yes. And I can just, I'm a salesperson at the, at the core. I mean, mm. I started in furniture, work in retail for four years is how I started. There, that's, there's no better training ground in the world because you right. get all the different personality types really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you why. And that's important in selling is giving someone the why do I need a $10,000 sofa? Well, right. let me tell you the 10 reasons why. It's not just that it's pretty. It's that this, 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 and this is the 10 reasons I picked this. So that's hugely important. So um, it's not like I don't, I don't give it an explanation or a reason or a benefit in, to, to the solution I'm providing. That's totally key in in our business. If mm -hmm. you can, you can pull together a beautiful room, but a client, people don't just buy stuff because I bring it in and plop it down. I have to you know, ad nauseum, give them 10 reasons why each selection was made. Because Absolutely. then they're like, oh, okay, okay, you know, that's just, that's core in selling. So if you're not a salesperson, you can't be, a, you're never going to have a successful business. You know, unfortunately, that's just the way it is because you have to convince people to part with their money. And a lot of it, Luann, is, it goes back to believing in like my point of view too, like, right. and, and, and believing that, you know, that's part of why you go out the first time is to kind of, 
see, is this person, do they really want to work with me? Do they really want, and this is something that's taken me years. I still to this day have to remind myself, I have value and this particular person isn't going to appreciate the value that I bring. Like right. I can, you know, so I don't need to work with them. Right. And, and sticking to that because sometimes even, you know, we've had a hugely successful business and, but it's still interior design. It's still a luxury business. It has its highs. It has its lows. I mean, we still have to run our, you know, it's not money all the time. I mean, that's just not reality at any business. There's, you know, it's an ebb and flow. It's the economy. It's people, you know, what their expectations are that they have to spend on something and talking them through that. So one thing I've learned through the years is working with mentors and other people that are in this business is that we all have the same like sort of scared part in our pro in our process that I'm never going to design again. Like no one's ever going to call me. I'm dried up, you know, this, and that's, that's a lie, but, right. it, but it, we all suffer from that when the phone doesn't ring. And so you'll have a meeting with the, with the prospect and they're just not a good fit and you take them. Mm. And I have to, because you're scared and I have to tell myself every time I, I'm in, I'm with one of these clients, with one of these prospects, you know, she's not, she, I can tell by talking with her or him that they don't, they're not going to appreciate the value that mm -hmm. I bring. Mm -hmm. They're not a believer. They just want furniture. They don't want a beautiful home. Mm -hmm. They just want me to sell them a sofa and two chairs and a rug. And they're going to be, you know, when the discussion's always around price, like when they just keep coming back to it, we have a discussion on price. I give people kind of r ranges of what things cost so that we're on the same page. And that they can say, holy cow, that's not what I want to spend. And we can part ways and no, no harm, no foul. Right. Um, but, and that's all on the phone. But, you know, when I would go to their house, you know, it was really, my, I had a mentor years ago and she said, Eric, give a little, get a lot. So by just going out on that first hour consult, you've already established trust because I've given them something. What I wanted to bring this conversation out to everyone is that this is another way to do it that's right. successful and right. and may ease some of your own pressure points or pain points in your business with not converting design clients into purchasers right. and just billing for time because honestly it is very i think it would be demotivating to spend all this time and energy specifying and to then just have them go try to buy it and they're going to screw it up mm -hmm. so i just think i feel for all these designers who are getting at that to that place with their clients and they're not seeing because the biggest um the most sad thing with a designer, I think all of us can agree on this as designers, is not seeing your vision come to fruition mm. and all the energy and the passion that we bring to projects and not see it fulfilled. I mean, I've been doing this 21 years professionally. I've been doing, I've been decorating since I was 12 years old, but you know, not, I still get excited on install day. When the drapes go up, I still get like a dance around like an idiot. I mean, <laughs> and so if I didn't have that part of it, it would really, it's a, that, that would not, I, that's the biggest motivator is to see it completed. It's to see everything put together and to stand back and walk through these spaces that I've walked through in my mind. Right. That's the thing. Times. It's not about just the process for you. It's about the end result. It's about that whole reveal. And it's about that satisfaction of being able to look and see the product and the work and the room and the environment that you've created. I mean, that's, that's really your, where your juice comes from. Yes. And the difference it makes in people's lives because I've clients every time they they cry. Um, then they tell me later, you know, if I would have known my children would have cleaned their rooms, I would have done it much <laughs> sooner, you know, or if I would have known how, what a difference this would have made in our family, right. I would have done this room much sooner. Right. Like, thank you for, for just creating peace and calm and chaos, you know, because a lot of what I do is really teaching people how to live. Mm. People don't know how to live. Like they were, you know, a lot of my clients, they've never had a decorator. They never had a home that's been professionally decorated. And I go in, you know, these people are 40 plus years old and they've got dorm furniture <laughs> you know, they've, and, and they don't, they don't know to put the coffee mugs by the coffee maker. Like, um, <laughs> and so a lot of what we do is really just sort of educating and every designer will say this regardless of their processes, you know, making people, people always say, I never knew I needed this. Right, right. I never knew I needed this. That's, that's, that's a great way to, to say it. I like that. Let me ask you a couple of questions about 
about um, the practical side of it. So when you have that initial phone call with somebody and you're going to lay out for them the way you work, what are some of the qualifying questions that you have, Eric, or what are some of the ways that you, because again, especially, it's funny, a, a, a newer design entrepreneur needs this information in order to learn how to vet and qualify clients on the phone if they're going to think about doing this model. But for you, it's become, it went, it probably went from very important to middle importance, but now I got to believe with your profile, you know, the high profile that you have now, it's now become also back to probably being really important to have a great qualifying process because if you are going to get 15 inquiries, maybe only three are truly viable potential clients for you. So what are some of the qualifying questions or conversation that you have that you get to, that you understand that this client does have the budget and is the type of client for you to then take that next step of going to their home? Qualifying is so important. And yes. I'm glad you brought it up because yeah, my wife sits, her office sits at the top of the stairs from our studio and our studio, our studio is in our basement, but it's a walkout and we have, it's the light down there is fantastic, which is why we bought the house. And so she overhears my conversations all the time and she's, you know, not one to not tell me what she thinks. <laughs> I love um, you, and she'll, she always says, you talk more people out of projects and you do into them. And I'm like, honey, that's a good qualifier. That's a that good means I'm qualifying, qualifying well. Right. Yeah. Um, because I just have learned over time that it's better to have those, co- those hard conversations early on than at the end or in the middle or before even, you know, right. you get you know, five meetings in and they're like, you know, you're really just, uh, we can't afford this. Or, right. And then you're like, you know, when really that was the objection from the beginning and they didn't have the nerve to tell you. And I will tell you this, it is very difficult for a Southerner to say no to someone. Mm-hmm. It is very difficult and it's probably difficult for anyone, but particularly <laughs> in the South where you don't talk about money. You don't talk about how much your house costs. You don't talk about, um, you, and people call you and they're, oh, we, we, I love your work. I've followed you for years. I so much want to redo my kitchen. I've got $30,000. Mm. You know, that's when those are hard. They were harder. But I've just learned some sort of nice ways to say, you know, you can't afford what you want, you, you know. Right. And so because it, you know, I would get myself in a lot of trouble by, oh, okay, well, I'll come out and see and talk and, you know, basically wishing that they turn into a customer rather than really asking the the right questions to determine if they are the right customer. Thank you because we get a lot of our email. I was like, thank you so much for your interest in our firm. Um, We are a full service interior design firm. We would love to talk with you more about your project over the phone. I find email to be impersonal. When can we schedule a phone call? Mm. Because I did find when I just sent, response i would i would sort of give them my spiel over email where i would say we have a one room minimum and we do and you can just tell them what your one room minimum is Mm -hmm. you know and depending on the kind of products you sell and then i say but what i noticed is i was not getting any replies like from giving them everything in the email right there wasn't the personal touch there wasn't my voice my intonation um you can't sell them I can't sell them you on email. You can't do the Eric sales, right? Right. Exactly. So I basically just would say, uh, I find email to be impersonal. When can we set up a conversation, you know, a phone conversation, phone call? And so we'll set a phone conversation and then I call and I, when we talk, I just say, I do have a one room minimum. And the, the first I'd say, this is how I work with my clients. That's when I give them the transparency, which is I'm going to buy it wholesale. I'm going to sell it to you at retail and I'm not going to bill for time. And the reason I do that is it gives me total control over the process because I'm buying everything directly from the manufacturers. I don't have to go through a third party. I can call and check on the status. I, can, I know exactly when it's shipping. It just streams on the process for everybody, and I can control the result. Then I say, in order, my minimum is one room. And here's what one room costs on average. I don't give them a starting. I used to give a starting price. The problem with that is that's all they hear. Is that's the right. You anchored price. the low number, right? So I say, the average price of a room is X and you know, which really in my firm, the average price is probably 35 to 45,000 
I mean, that's of a room. And I always say, now that depends on the size of your room. If you have a room the size of a three car garage, which we have a lot of those in the suburbs. <laughs> right. It's going to be three times that price. Be, yeah. Your bedroom is, the, you know, the size of three regular bedrooms. So it's going to be, you know, $80,000. Right. And I say these numbers to them because right. I just think it's better. And what I say is, look, I hope I, I, I like to have these discussions up front because it does neither of us any good for me to come out to your house, meet you, get you, have you fall in love with me, have me fall in love with your project, me come back, pull together a stunning room, present it to you, you fall in love with the new room, I price it, you can't have it. Right. Everybody's mad at the end of that. Right. So it's better that we talk, you know, if this feels good to you, let me know. Do you know, do you want to, do you want to set up a meeting? Do you want me to come out and learn more about your project? I mean, most people will be like right away. And most people say, you know, let me talk to my husband, which basically means <laughs> no way. Moving. No way. <laughs> and because, but I think, you know, I don't, I don't think it's, I, I think that's kind of not an aggressive way to say it. I think it just it, it, it politely informs them of what our minimum is because we get people who are like, I see you are a Tebow vendor. Can I come pick wallpaper? No. Right. <laughs> you know, my assistant, you know, said, you know, the person, you know, my assistant will, will answer the phone and just say, we are not open to the public air. We do, we're a full service interior design firm and we do whole rooms. Eric would love to meet with you about your project. If you have a room, no, right. oh, no, we're just looking for wallpaper or we're mm. just, you know, right. But, you know, I'm, Years ago, I would, I mean, I, I don't go out for paint anymore if I do. People, and what I do basically is price people out of the market. So if they'll right. say, I want you to come pick my paint, I'm like, okay, it's $2,500. Right. And if they pay it, you'll pick paint. Yeah. And, you know, and that's where years ago, a, 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 we hired a consultant to look at our process. I mean, because we're always looking at, you know, is, is this, is this going to work? You know, right. is, how, is, how am I going to sustain this business? You know, if people stop wanting to work this way, you know, that's, but I, maybe, I don't know, five or seven years ago, a guy and he's like, well, and I was like, Oh, cause all I was doing was going out and doing paint consults. It felt like, mm. and I was billing them right. a lot per hour, but you know, going back to how I pick paint, I can pick paint in an hour. So then I went to, well, I'll do a three hour minimum. So at least I make, you know, a thousand dollars or mm -hmm. seven, you know, and then it was like it does that wasn't bringing me joy because it was not it was again it was picking paint paint's not sexy i mean so you know it just it, bringing me joy is a room and what happens is you get so bogged down emotionally with going to pick 10 people's paint mm. and you're making let's say that's making five thousand dollars right versus the energy it takes to do one room and you're not emotionally prepared. So like when, because you're so bogged down, like this is just for me, Yes. you know, being with, I'm an introvert really. So when, when I'm being with people, I have to really turn it on. And so if I'm having to go out and meet 10 people and tell me about how many kids do you have? Where does your husband work? Where do you that? What did you move here from? Oh, I love DC. You know, that, that just, that's emotionally taxing. So then I get a phone call from a sweet old lady. This is my mojo. Okay. 45 to 65. They, this is their like third home. Their kids are gone. They want it done. They got money. That's my, that's my sweet spot. Mm. Okay. But I'm tired. Cause I've been to 10 emotion zappers. Right. And I'm like, well, I can, I've got all these pain. I can see you in two or three weeks. And then I'm just, I'm not a hundred percent Eric. I'm not excited to be with her. I mean, all people pick up on all of that. Yes. So for me, my pricing came to what is going to make me happy to go out and pick someone's backsplash because we get we get in, we get calls like that and i know every designer listening probably does like i just want you to pick my kitchen backsplash <laughs> well, i'm like you know what you don't really need a designer right. you can go to the tile store and have the tile person pick that for free i don't say that what i say is that's where the southerner in me like i could not say to someone you know what your backsplash isn't important enough because mm -hmm. that's just not nice right. i can't say that <laughs> But we're in a business, you know, I have to make money. So all this has to, you know, make money for our business to support our family. So that's where you have to find the balance of making money and being nice to people. So I would just say, you know what, I can do that. It's my fee is to leave my office is $2,500. Right. <laughs> because, you know, I don't sell tile and I don't sell paint. That's where you have to really 
believe in your system, whatever it is. Instead of trying to adopt everybody else's pricing structure, you have, we I've had to really look at what makes money, what doesn't make money, take the stuff that doesn't make money off the table, or price it at a premium where someone who really appreciates my value who sees the value in me people do pay us those crazy fees for right crazy, i imagine they do i imagine but, they do but they see the value they right. you know it's taken me 30 years to go in there and pick that gorgeous backsplash it's taken me 30 years that's where my system rewards your experience and your expertise right. where, where you're just a flat fee for the things that you can't make money on and the client pays you. You don't see them. It's it's one or two meetings. You don't see them again. They're happy, you know. Right. And 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 you haven't said no. You haven't had to say no. You just said, okay, I'd love to come pick your paint. This is my fee for leaving my office. And then most, you know, ten people, nine out of ten say no. One says yes, and I make the same money right. as if I'd gone to ten people. Right. So you have, but you have to really believe it for it to work. You can't. You can't backslide into, oh, my God, I need $250, so I'm going to go pick their paint. Because what happens is then you, you start – it zaps your energy. It doesn't leave you available for that great client who calls that you can just run right out and start their project right. because you're not bogged down with all of these little things. And that's even true, Luann. I want to say this to young designers because it sort of came to me early on in my career. Ruthann and I were first married. We've married 24 years this December. Oh, congrats. And we were first married, broke as anything, you know, had no money, lived in this tiny little apartment. And I was doing interior design work. And these people wanted it. People want a discount. This is, you know, and I literally said to her, because you're always, especially when you're young and you're hungry and you're trying to build your client base and you want people to work with you. And, you know, they're like, well, I want it cheaper. You know, well, how can we get this down? And we were getting ready one morning, fighting over this tiny little 30 inch sink and elbows and arms everywhere because we're both tall in this <laughs> tiny little bathroom and i just looked at her and i said you know what millionaires don't get discounts <laughs> it just it came to me in a flash and it just and it really informed my entire business structure was like either you see the value that i bring yes. or you don't I love and it. i just i'm not going to try and defend it to you right I'm not going to over over explain why I deserve this. Either you believe I have this value and you're willing to pay me or you don't. Right. I, I'm very creative. I'm an artist. I love putting pretty things together. But the, the goal is to make money is to monetize my passion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get I didn't get into design to make money. I got into interior design because it fed me and my soul, mm. my, my passions. But I've made money because I'm good at it. And I think my biggest point to this conversation today is look at your business and your numbers and what feeds you as a designer, mm. literally and uh, metaphorically, what feeds you. How much money do you need to make to run your business and then set it up that way? Right. And the market will either reward you or it won't. And if it's not, then you need to find another job. Right, 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 right. I, I, I mean, look, it's it's clear that A, you're passionate about this point of view, that B, it works for you. And what I really want to get across to people is it's okay to mark up and it's okay to tell people no. And because you because of the value that you add and i think people sh run away from it shy away from it i think it's rude or confrontational and it doesn't have to be it's really just this is how i run my business it's telling people what the rules are on the front end so that there's no misunderstanding now that's not to say they don't lie i mean that they change the rules on you but mm -hmm. you can't then you then you're allowed to be mad right 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 they've misrepresented themselves right right but you're not allowed to be mad when you allowed them to change the rules on the front end or say, well, I really only have 20,000. Can you do that? And what I usually tell people, say to people who say that to me, I say, look, I want to work with you. I think this would be a great project, but save and get another 10,000 and save in your, in your, you know, towards the project and call me. Yes. Because I can go through and do all this work and because people will say, well, can't we just buy some of the stuff and go ahead and get it delivered? Well, you know what? I'm not, there's no wow at the end of that. Yeah. 
they're not going to be wowed when I deliver a sofa, two chairs, and a rug. Right, right. And I don't have lamps and art and curtains and all that. Right. So I just say, you know, save your money, get get another ten thousand. Let's talk. You know, right. I, I because I just explained to them, I want you to be wowed because that's the only way I get your friend across the street. Right. Well, what I love, Eric, is the bottom line is is that. Everything that you're saying, you have come to through your 20 plus years experience. And the the critical thing at work here is that you are very clear on what you will do and what you will not do. And you're perfectly comfortable leaving behind the clients and the projects that don't fit your model because you've learned through experience that they're not profitable, that there's no point in doing it. There's no point in wishing and hoping that it will become a good situation for you. You have have literally sat and evaluated what a good situation for you looks like. And if it's not going to result in that, you're okay to say no. And, And the thing is that the other component of that is to be clear in the conversation from the first contact with the client. And that's what you're doing. And the, and the truth of it is, is it's what we say here on the show all the time is agreements that are made before emotion, before money, before attachment, before positioning has taken place are are just simply take it or leave it agreements. This is how I do it. You don't have to do it my way. There's a dozen other amazing designers in Nashville. Call one. Correct. (laughs) And that's the, you know, you don't have to explain your no. It's another way I would, you know, a lot of Southerners, because I've learned this from people who are not from the South that say to me, you know, you don't, have to friends that are like you know eric you don't have to explain why you didn't go to x person's party or why you didn't you know decide to take that project right you, don't you have just to, didn't you're, yeah, like you're... This, you have to call someone up and you have i've had to do it and say you know what thank it was so nice meeting with you and learning more about your project and your family but unfortunately i'm not gonna be able to take your project right the other and thing... every time they say thank you for letting me know nobody has ever said well why not i thought we hit it off because you know what they, they feel they, it they too <laughs> they feel it too i've never had anybody say that exactly exactly and they, i love it i love it and the other the other the vein of all this is is understanding what you have what you understood at that moment at the sink with Ruth Ann all those years ago is that you understood who you were going to sell to and what your brand was going to look like a lot of time there's a grieving process that I have to remind myself what my original goal is in my business what my vision is which is I have value I deserve to make this money they will either accept it or not obviously we you know could clearly talk for days and days (laughs) so before you go I just please tell everybody the name of your new book and that they can get it by going to your your website, Eric, where they can see this beautiful aesthetic of yours with all the layer and the color and the personality that is your signature style. Tell us about yes. it. Yes. Okay. Enduring Southern Homes mm-hmm. is my new book and it just came out in March as a celebration of 10 years in business for myself. Um, and it basically is 12 projects that I've done in the last two years and to and they're full houses and i tell little anecdotal stories about working with clients as a southerner we love storytelling mm. and so it's it's full of stories every every project i tell a little snippet of just how, you know, interaction with the client or i have a family member i did their house in there and so it just it's i think it's a fun read because it's not just about it's just not pretty pictures of rooms but also the thought process behind each room and the parameters that the client gave me and funny stories that, you know, clients, they say the strangest thing. So there's some really fun things <laughs> in there about it. Um, and it is full of beautiful pictures and I'm really proud of it. I wrote it myself. It was, it was a real labor of love. And I really came out with it as an antidote to white rooms because they're so prevalent. And I think it's because that's all anyone sees on Instagram. Mm. And, and so I just, I wanted to add another voice to the conversation much like I did today about about just a different way to look at running your business. I just wanted to put it out there and say, hey, there's not one right way to do something. There's other ways, but here's here are some tools to examine what would be successful for you and what fits with your life. And that's how my clients' homes are. I mean, they're extensions of their own stories and their own histories. And that's, again, quintessential of being in the South is we're handed down a lot of furniture. Um, and so they all, everything 
sort of a sentimental and mean something. So that's what my book is about. And um, I'll be you know, having a couple of book stops, uh, book signings coming up in the fall. So we're excited about that, but we're glad to be home for the next six weeks working on projects. That's one thing I don't want to, I hope people don't lose a uh, fact or the, to see that we, I am a working designer. So, yes. you know, I have to, I want one thing with the book tour, I told my wife, Ruthann, is I don't want to be, look so busy that people stop calling. Right, you know, right, oh, right, he's, right. He's too busy for my project. I just right. got back from Colorado with a new client. So, and that was just, she read, she found my book in Barnes and Noble in Denver. So, whoa, I know, Isn't but I mean, it's, it's, it's a regular client. They're just, I mean, it's, they're just in D Colorado, but right. you know, she wanted me to come. She wants a Southern traditional home right. in, in Colorado. Right, so, right. um, so we look forward to meeting new people because of the book. The book's really given us access to just more, um, well-wishers and fans as well as new new customers nice. so we're excited about that very exciting well i'm looking forward to seeing you and ruth ann again she is just amazing i mean talk about a dynamo team and how much I, what i love is in person it's so clear that you are a team and that she's so a part of all the success that the firm has that it's really the two of you together working very hard to, with it and i i love it it's it's a joy to see the two of you working work together. Thank you so much. We've we've enjoyed ten years strong on the on working together. We started as a six month trial and we're still working together. So <laughs> it's been successful. That's awesome. Well thanks so much for your time today, Eric. I appreciate it. Thank you. Before I share my takeaways, I want to remind you to look for Eric's book, Enduring Southern Homes. You can get your signed copy through his website at ericrossinteriors.com. It is a beautiful portfolio of his work, his observations on design, and his relationships with his clients. Okay, so my takeaways. First of all, Eric knows that it is his choice how he runs his firm. And because this has come from experience, he no longer feels the need to change, apologize, or conform to a client's ex expectations of how to hire and work with a designer, regardless of that client's previous experience with other designers, right? The biggest lesson in this takeaway is not really how Eric chooses to charge his clients. That's his prerogative. You may or may want to go along with that. That's not my biggest takeaway. My biggest takeaway is that he does what works for him. You see, I get emails all the time. People say to me, I heard this on this show. They say to do this. I heard this on that show. That designer says to do it this way. And I need you to hear this. You don't have to do anything like any other designer. You just have to do you, just like Eric does him. If your current business model for fee structures is working for you, don't feel like you have to change it because you've heard something on a show. The point of the show is, in all these conversations with people like Eric that have a body of experience, the point is that they are here to help you think, to help you figure out what works for yours, for your business, right? And I like to say all the time, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? So, but to my point, Eric sits in his decision to do it his way, despite having heard dozens of his colleagues over the last 500 episodes describe their way, okay? Makes sense, right? Now, the next thing is, I love that he has a specific intake process that helps him weed out the clients that are not a fit for his firm. He, and I think it's interesting, and I like it, that he likes to have that conversation himself. I know many of you don't. Again, if it's working for you, awesome. But the thing is, I know, because I know Ruth Ann, I know that Ruth Ann is talented, that she's a hashtag smart lady, and I know that she is 100% capable of handling these intake calls for Eric. But for Eric, he chooses to do it himself because he's not only in that conversation deciding for himself if the client and the project might be a fit. Eric knows as an 
an absolute outstanding salesperson that in that conversation, he is already on his way to establishing trust and rapport with the client if they do turn out to be a good fit and he wants to take the project, okay? This is an important step in the selling process, okay? For even like businesses like ours, Window Works, The calls are coming in all day. Our salespeople are out on the road all day. But we do have a process that we have learned from our colleagues at Exciting Windows. Every salesperson has to call an appointment that's been set within two hours to say, hi, I understand, Adriana made an appointment for me to meet you. Tell me a little bit more about your project. And, you know, is there anything particular you'd like me to know? And all it does is it starts to establish that rapport. Okay, so the other thing is I also loved his advice when dealing with new clients that he prefers to lock down a manageable piece of the project right away. He would rather contract with a new client for a much smaller part of the project, one or two rooms, as opposed to a whole house. Okay, and did you hear his whys on this? Number one, he said it's easier for a new client to agree to 30K than 100K for a first time collaboration, right? And he said, by only setting his sights on that smaller project, the 30K project, for example, he's much more likely to get it cleaner and quicker, okay? So less muck and mire on the way to getting it done. It's pretty brilliant, okay? And then he also said a smaller project allows him to really learn what is important to the client with regard to their money, their budget, and lifestyle. Because we always know that... It's not about how much money somebody has to spend on a project. It's what, how they process the value versus the money. So two people might both have $30,000 to spend on a project, but one person might have, um, Leslie Price's clients come to mind, where they have a true affinity to fine art and having art be focal. So some, one person might spend 10000 of a $30,000 budget on art where another person is going to say, yeah, we'll do the art in a couple of years, <laughs> right? Like, so it's, this is the thing, and he's learning this about his clients in a smaller project, okay? And the good thing about this is, and how he uses it, is this information helps him tremendously when they do take the next step of the several rooms all at the next juncture, right? He has learned what they place value in and it saves him time on the next project, which is going to be larger and more detailed theoretically, right? Okay. And then lastly, on a single smaller project with an overall smaller dollar spend, It means that it feels less risky for the client to engage and to say yes and to go forward. So he knows he's more likely to have creative control because his ultimate primary goal, you heard him, he wants to deliver a wow. Okay, because he knows if he can do all of that, then he's much more likely to gain the next project for them as well as the referral. All right. So many good business lessons here. I love it. You can see that Eric is a businessman first. And among all of his tips and advice, I really loved when he said, I've learned it's better to have the hard conversations in the beginning rather than the end or even the middle. I mean, you know, this is a man after my own heart. You know that, right? (laughs) So... And I want to say I have a little treat for you too. Toward the end of our conversation, we were about to wrap up. And then Eric started to explain to me how he handles the reveal install. Okay. And it just kind of, what it was is I think, I think I felt like it would have pushed this particular interview a little bit long that you might've looked at it in your um, queue and thought, really, I'm not listening that long. Right. But I know it was great information. So what I did was I had my editor slice it out and tomorrow it's going to air as its own little mini episode. It's a little 15, 20 minute conversation about how Eric executes the process for selling accessories and designing to completion. Okay. It's pretty cool. I have to say, um, I think it's worth the listen and that's why I I approach it this way. Okay. So, all right. Now, huge thanks to Eric and to our sponsor, Kirsch. Kirsch is a company who knows and appreciates tradition, just like Eric Ross. For more than 100 years, they've been designing and producing quality drapery hardware for design and window treatment professionals, just like us. Find your local distributor and open your account today at Kirsch, K-I-R-S-C-H.com. All right. Thanks for joining me today. Make sure to stop by tomorrow for the bonus 
bonus mini episode. And you know what I'm going to ask you? I'm going to ask you to decide to be excellent in everything that you do today. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.